Um, thank you. Can you hear me? Or, uh, thank you, Leslie and Omar. Uh, that's a wonderful opportunity for me uh, to, to, to try a new work, uh, which could become the one, one chapter of a new project, a new book project. And I envision this project as a collection of literary stories, not a literary history, but literary stories. The first chapter uh, as as main character, the narration, the second one, the fiction, and the third, nothing less than the book. But my apologies uh, for what I'm going to display now. Violence. Tonight, here is the one thing that everybody seems to be missing. The extreme left on this planet is actively calling for violence. As world economies go down the tank and unemployment continues to rise, which some might say, maybe some of these politicians actually want, the disenfranchised people are set to explode. And now, I was handed this this morning when I got into work. I've been trying to get a copy of this for a while. It is a brand new book. It is a dangerous book. It is called The Coming Insurrection. The Coming Insurrection. It is... It is written by the Invisible Committee. It calls for um, a violent revolution. An on anonymous group from France, of all places, called the Invisible Committee, uh, penned it. They want to bring down capitalism and the Western way of life. This started in France and started to spread to countries like Greece and Iceland, where people are out of work, out of money, and out of patience. Now, it's about to come here to America. The book. So we're watching a man on a screen, maybe you know him, maybe he's not your best friend, but he's speaking. He displays all the characteristics of a vigorous, conservative, Republican, married, paternal, naturally born to lead American. He's white, his name is Glenn Beck, he has a baby face and a crew cut, and he's wearing the mandatory uniform of a red tie with white stars, a striped shirt, and a dark suit. He leans his elbows on the table and he uses them to emphasize all of his gestures. It's like we are at his house and he's talking to us in private. We even feel a little like he's gossiping with us, he's speaking to us so casually. But don't let that fool you. What he's about to tell us is serious. We're watching Fox News, it's July the 1st, 2009. He starts with the typical idiotic conspiracy theories. But then, less than a minute in the show, into the show, something happens. And suddenly, we're confronted with the unexpected, the incredible, the weird. He holds up a small book. Yes, you heard me correctly, a book. And he not only holds it up, he flips through it, he turns a few pages without reading them. And we can tell right away that he hasn't read the book and that this doesn't matter. He hasn't read it yet because he just got it. But he's been waiting for it for a long time. It's a brand new book. He tells us, and he looks us at us knowingly. It is a dangerous book. And he looks at us threateningly. It is called The Coming Insurrection, and here he takes his time. He exaggerates each syllable and holds up the book again. He's especially sure to repeat the title two times, and the second time is even more terrifying. It is written by the Invisible Committee. Now, he looks utterly aghast because, as he's telling us at this very moment, he calls for a violent revolution. He gives a little automatic smile, a knowing smile, while he tells his viewers that this Invisible Committee is an anonymous group and he emphasizes anonymous, which comes from France, of course, although actually he doesn't really say of course, but we can hear it in a way. The setting changes. The screen is divided into four parts. Glenn, because on Fox News we call everyone by their first names, so it's Glenn who's talking to us. Glenn is relegated to the top left corner while the other three screens show images of riots violent protests and clashes with the police. We see fire, lots of fire, and we see it often. This book, Glenn tells us, want to slaughter capitalism and the Western way of life. 
The fire crosses Europe, Greece, Iceland, France, but so far, as Glenn knows, Americans could care less. Now, he says, and despite all of the danger, all of the fear, or perhaps because of them, because of all of the danger and all of the fear is now, is a calm now. It's almost soft and comforting. It is the now of something that was always going to happen. And finally, here it is. We have to acknowledge it. We almost have to be glad that it's finally here because the wait has been terrible. Now, he say, it's about to come here to America. Why? Because the book comes out in August, and it's August the 9th. And he tells us that he has one of the very first English translations. The background image changes again. And has, uh, as he reaches what has become almost a Godwin's law for conservative Americans, the 2005 riots in the suburbs of Paris. The screen is split in half. Glenn is on one side, the fire is on the other, a lot of fire. And suddenly, the unexpected, the incredible comes back. Glenn brandishes another book, his own book. And this one is titled Common Sense. He starts working through his reasoning, a reasoning that is, and I want to state this at the beginning so that you know where I'm going with this, inherently religious. Glenn believes that the power of books is like the power of prophecies. Glenn has predicted in his own book that the dangerous publications like this one would exist. And boom, here it is. The coming insurrection heralds the arrival of insurrection and bam, here those are two. Aren't books magical? What's happening here now is deadly serious. It's going to be available in English. We have to watch out. The fire doubles in size, the flames have almost reached the little part of the screen where Glenn is hiding. That little part must be America because in Europe it's always burn, it's already burning. It doesn't stop. He waves the two books again, but this time he waves them one after the other so that we can tell the difference between them. This is a book of revolution. Glenn shows the coming insurrection. And this is a book of peaceful revolution, and Glenn shows common sense. A book of what? what? What is it again, Glenn? A book that is about, that is made of, that can lead us to, I lean in closer, begin to get a sense of what a, what a truly remarkable individual. This is the end of the, the, this show, I guess. Uh, sorry for that. Um, uh, it's not a book on revolution, but a book permitted in revolution, and that will inevitably lead us to it. Because books and life are the same thing. So much so, at this in Glenn's evidence, that the French government is so freaked out about this book that they arrested nine people believed to have written the coming insurrection. And this for supposed acts of terrorism and sabotage. Glenn just can't help himself from coming back to this point, so he comes, it back, uh, comes back to it again. The first time that he ever heard about the books was in an article on bizarre, bizarre literary and community practices. People were getting together and organizing collective translation workshops. Glenn is religious, as I already mentioned, and his software of choice is the gospel which is about dissidents who come together in order to spread the good news of the kingdom of God. But there are also bad dissidents who can do the same thing, but they spread the wrong news. It tells us about his personal Gomorrah, New York City, where the bad dissidents were reading unauthorized portions of this book in New York City bookstores. Notice how he accentuates unauthorized unauthorized, which refers to so many things, such as the anonymous author or the unauthorized translation, which in turn refers to the fable that we share about books, a fable which at its core is about ownership and capitalism. But now the dissidents have gone too far. They are 
they're even, read the, they're even reading their books in Starbucks. And it's here again things that we are doomed. We are doomed because people are reading out loud and reading out loud in Starbucks books that advocate theft, sabotage, and a refusal to work. We are so doomed that even young Japanese people have started marching in protests, so doomed that the Japanese Communist Party has been gaining 1,000 new members per month, even though, no, Glenn says, they don't do that, do that in Japan. It's coming, and it's coming soon, and it's coming now. We can't underestimate the radical left because it's spreading. The book is being passed from person to person, and it's being disseminated on the internet. Glenn has no choice. He needs to make an extreme decision. First of all, he doesn't ask for the book to be banned because it's important to know what people are thinking. Good, thanks. Second of all, he doesn't promote violence. Good again. You're an idiot if you start shooting people. All that does is delegitimize the cause. Quote. Instead, he decides to do something even more extreme. Glenn is going on vacation tomorrow, and he's going to take the book with him in order to read it. Yes, he's going to read it, even though he promised his family that it would only read happy things. Then he'll be able to tell us what it actually says. So what makes this book so dangerous? So dangerous that the celebrity commentator of a major conservative American television network devoted so much energy to it. So dangerous that the French state imprisoned, imprisoned nine people and flung open what became known as the so-called Tarnak case, getting enmeshed in another one of these judiciary true crime fire schools that he does so well. The combination of the two, the celebrity commentator and the French state, thus gave the book a double recognition, the likes of which no other French book has received for a very long time, except Piketty, of course. It's amazing when you think about it, a national trial converging with a media trial on what was, at the time, the largest conservative media network in the world. Many authors who I know would sell their souls for half or even a quarter of a comparable joy. We can't help but think about similar cases that came before, even though they already seem like they happened such a long time ago. For instance, Pierre Guillotin in the 60s, uh, the French writer, all the cases that happened even longer ago, Charles Baudelaire, Gustave Flaubert. I recall this case of literary trials because the so-called Turner case, and here com comes my hypothesis, is, fundam is fundamentally a literary trial, even as we use it as a false pretext to debate terrorism in our courts. Each of these literary trials thus reveals an anxiety that corresponds to its period, an anxiety about the production of literature and the production of truth. When we talk about the 19th century, we often mistakenly allude to morality, but it was really all about putting realism on trial. When we talk about the 60s of the 20th century, we discuss morality and politics, but the true sources of anxiety were the hordes of young, educated people and readers, which we could also call democratization. With the Turner case, we refer to terrorism, but it's a trial that pulls us back to the question that Immanuel Kant, the German philosopher, famously asked in 1790, what is a book? And it's true after all, what is a book? What is a book that Glenn waves, us, waves at us on a television set? What is a book when we are reading its unauthorized translation in the middle of a Starbucks? What is a book that leads, that leads to the arrest of nine people? These questions are not at all insignificant because their answer depends on how we think about the collective body, about politics, and about democracy. I might be moving too fast. And if you are, aren't already familiar with this case, and I'm sure you're not familiar with this case, I can quickly go over its main cadences. The starting point was nothing out of the ordinary, a book called The Communist Erection. 
and some criminal intrigue. Someone sabotaged several tra train lines. The two are linked by a series of readers, the police, the legal system, and the political world, who I'm calling Bovarian, uh, referring to uh, uh, Emma Bovary uh, in uh, uh, Flaubert's novel. Because, okay, let's put it in the most simplistic terms, they have a tendency to confuse what is real and what is fiction. The book, thus, became the sole evidence in a trial by media, and an important one as its, its principal actors were the then Minister of the Interior and the still acting head of the French National Railway Corporation, and it was broadcast during prime time on the most viewed private national French television channel. And the book continued to be evidence in a protean, constantly shifting legal trial that lasted for 10 years until the French Supreme Court finally dismissed the false charges of terrorism. But even now, we can't help but feel that it will never truly, e truly end. So if there was no real legal basis for the, for the case, what was it actually about? In my opinion, it was about the following, that the book has no official author, except for an invisible collective. And it is this fact that calls into question the entire modern structure of literature. What is a book? What is a book without an author, without, without visibility, without rights of ownership? How can we use such a book? Can a book be evidence because the modern structure of, of the literary is none other than the modern structure of ownership, or to put it in other words, capitalism's raison d'etre. These are the actual questions of the Turner case, and they are the fundamental questions, um, literary questions of the new millennium. The Invisible Committee's text have spread around the entire world, you can see it uh, on the screen, in every imaginable form, print or digital, of official or pirated copies as extracts of or in their entirety. In the wake of the Turner case, we can consider the coming insurrection to be an unlikely international bestseller. But honestly, we can say that we weren't warned. Other the Invisible Committee didn't plan the specific literary history that I'm about to trace. We can say that it didn't, in a way, predict all that happened. A trial about books and literature, or rather, the trial of a certain idea of the book, which is also a certain idea of literature, of capitalism, <laughs> sorry. It did it by over-determining its literary characteristics. Look at this way. The book describes seven circles of hell, high Dante, all before breaking away, fleeing the city, high Boccaccio, and finally ending in a state of dystopic anticipation. I, who, maybe James Graham Ballard or some, someone like that? If we're talking about the actual nature of the book, there is another imaginary collective, a collective that is a sort of cousin of the invisible committee that definitely shares some of its authors. It is a collective that is truly literary. I'm talking about the Tikkun collective which was making itself heard and emphatically well before the coming insurrection and the start of a, the Turner case. In November, um, in November of 1999, they sent a letter to Eric Azan, the director of the publishing house La Fabrique, uh, who has published uh, the coming insurrection in French. Uh, here's what they wrote. You can see it on the screen. Dear Eric, you will find enclosed the new version, largely augmented and divided into section of men machines, directions for, for use. Despite its appearance, it does not behave like a book, but like an editorial virus. Okay, okay. They obviously like using pre peremptory statements, but we are nonetheless going to try to understand what they mean here. We are in 1999, it's the internet's prehistoric period before social networks, before blogs, before even MySpace. In this prehistoric universe, the 20th century's 90s, viruses play the starring roles. They inhabit our dreams and our nightmares. 
They embody a threat, of course, but also a source of liberation. They are a bit, if you want to think of this way, of it this way, like an equivalent of today's dark net, dark net. But our imaginary pertaining to the viewers is also, is also part of the history of the book and of the literature. For since the 16th century, since the development of what a historian, Benedict Anderson, to quote it, termed print capitalism, we have begun thinking about the book as an organism, as a healthy or good body. And we did this because we were scared of this organism's other side, which we have begun to see and to dread, and which we could certainly associate with viruses. Because now, in these early modern times, with the advent of a new technology, the printed book, it could circulate, it could spread. We didn't know how to stop it. It was almost beyond all control. We needed a concept to organize all of this. Let's name it then. It has to do with the book, but not just any book, because there are as many concepts of books as there are concepts of the world. It has to do with the modern version of the book, which is an institution as much as it is an ideology. It's in this sense that we can understand the following sentence, the following sentence here. Book, um, the book is a dead form insofar it was holding its reader in the same fraudulent completeness, in the same esoteric arrogance as the classic subject in front of his peers, no less than the classic figure of man. The book, the subject, and man all connected in the same network. The Tikkun writers could say that they are referring implicitly to a text which solidified the modern imaginary of the book. It dates from over 200 years earlier than Tikkun's text from 1780. The author is Kant, the text is titled What is a Book? and it's an excerpt from Science of Rights. It is a fascinating text. But before we go into it further, here is a moment of historical context. The second half of the 18th century is in many ways a mirror of our current era. I'll say willingly that this familiarity comes from a tension, one that these two moments share, between old frames of intelligibility and the new surges that those frames couldn't possibly avert. The essential component of the 18th century societies is the following, the birth of a su sufficient, sufficiently large social class, the bourgeoisie, which bursts apart the previous system of caste-based social representations. I can already hear you telling me that I'm digressing, that there's no obvious link between this and Glenn or the Invisible Committee, but of course there is a link. And of course, it is the book. A version of the book that is growing and increasingly dangerous. This strange, reproducible object that has already has so many had so many lives, but that is going to go onto what yet another, right at the moment, the 18th century, that it becomes one of the first objects to be industrialized and commercialized on a large scale. Print capitalism. It's a remarkable expression, one that we need to follow all the way to its end, to back into its final corner. Are the two words actually that different? We could say that print is a qualifying adjective. Hardly, no, print is the very condition of capitalism's development. As one of the most precociously industrialized objects, the printed object is a perfect laboratory which we can use to study this then new economy. From the 16th to the 18th centuries, everywhere in Europe, and to a smaller extent in the United States, startups are emerging that will become soon in the 19th century big companies. New professional categories are appearing everywhere in Europe, soon entire legions of citizens, newly rich and educated, will appear and they will grow and grow, but officially they don't, they don't exist yet. In the old regime, in the old regi and in the old regime of the book, we don't yet know about these people. We don't know about literature either, or about what is not yet called literature. 
We can't find them in the literary scene, which from now, now is the 18th century, we still call poetry or fine letters. Fine letters is a transi tra transitional term in between poetry and literature. We don't say literature. If we want to talk about the regime of literary artistic pr production, we say poetry. Who cares that at the same time, there are more and more texts written in prose. They don't belong in this regime. We joke about them the same way that we joke about all the bourgeois that are as absent from the political stage as novels are from the literary stage. But here again, the improbable happens, as incredible as Glenn Beck waving a book at us on the set of Fox News. Despite everything, books are going to multiply, then multiply again. And they aren't going to multiply all by themselves because at every movement, they are accompanied by a series of participants. And these participants reproduce. From now on, there, uh, there and more and more of them. The brigades of the non-represented arrive, and they are greedy for, for their representation. They bring their favorite mode of expression with them, the novel. Poetry, poetry reclaimed, and will never reclaim again, the task of representing the ideal world, a world in which the aristocracy saw itself reflected. It was a universe in which everything was perfectly organized around certain concepts. Mimesis, exemplarity, the virtuosity of language that needed to be coded in order to be recognizable. A universe in which everything was organized around a principle, rarity and around a certain economy, patronage. The multiplication of books in a, is an explosion and a premise of disorder, particularly as anarchy is, everything, is everywhere in Europe, not politically, but in books, uh, in book system. We are publishing anything and everything we translate hurriedly, we borrow, we copy. Books become dangerous. They are editorial viruses. They anticipate the slogan that will burn through the Argentinian literary world as it rebuilds itself from the rubble of the 2001 economic crisis, primo publicar, después escribir, escribir. First publish, then write. The cartoneras that are emblematic of that moment in Argentina are also editorial viruses, a recent update to the disorder that characterized the second half of the 18th century in Europe. The bourgeoisie, for now newly constituted, but soon to be in power, can stand all of this. And it's here, it's here that our hero, Immanuel Kant, steps in. It's not that he revolutionized everything by himself. He draws from a century of shared reflection, but he condenses and crystallizes. A bit like Len, who a good Kantian without knowing it, condenses and crystallizes American conservatism, but we have to admit, with less talent. Even though what is happening is urgent, Kant uh, acts calmly. He produces a doctrine, a doctrine of rights intended to put an end to the anarchic situation. Of course, he does not want things to go back to the way they were before, before print capitalism but he's not at all happy with the way that things are going. It's all looking too much like the, first, the fire that Glenn loves to broadcast at us. Kant's strategy is impressive in that he disgraces his doctrine of rights, wrapping it in an entirely new symbolical architecture, one on which rights will eventually depend. We could say that he produces a fiction dressed up in the attributes of the obvious. He thus asks two questions, which become the two parts of a single legislative text, because they are the front and the back of the same coin, which is print capitalism. Was ist Geld? Was ist ein Buch? What is money? What is a book? At the end of the 18th century, no two questions are more decisive, and they maintain their importance as we move into the beginning of the 21st century. So what is a book for Kant? A book, writes Kant, you can see it on the screen, is a writing which contains 
a discourse addressed by someone to the public through visible signs of speech. It is a matter of indifference to the present considerations whether it is written by a pen or imprinted by types and on few or many pages. You and I may be as regrettably materialist as we are, could have responded to the same question with some, something simpler, something like a book is an object. An object that I can open in a television studio, for example, in order to say, this is a dangerous book. At least we, do, we could start here before moving on to something more complex. But that, that's exactly what Kant wants, Kant wants to avoid. His entire project is to extract the book from its materiality and to make it into an abstraction. The original German emphasizes immediately what the English translator postpones until the following sentence. It is a matter of indifference to the present consideration whether it is written by pen or imprinted by types and on few or many pages. A matter of indifference, therefore, to materiality, which the text only mentions in the phrase through visi visible signs, signs of speech. And we can all agree that that is extremely abstract. As well as an indifference to length, an indifference to action, and a dissimulation of the rupture that the introduction of printing, of printing produced. A dissimulation, therefore, of capitalism's arrival into print. All of this is important because it allows Kant to introduce a different idea, that of speech, red in German. An idea that is so central that Kant describes the very person who employs speech, the speaker, as barely anything more than a someone, Yemen. Not yet an author that will come later, but Kant is logical. First, he needs to render abstract the very idea of the author in order to convert it into what Foucault will later call a function. What is striking here is that he quickly imposes another idea, one that is essential to the creation of the concept of the author, the public. Here, the text does something truly new, as up until this point, the public referred to only two things, a political entity or the people in attendance at the performance. This new public organized around the book is a strange thing. It is connected to, his per to this person, to someone, and we still have no idea who, who he could be. Kant is getting to that. He who speak, I quote, he who speaks to the public in his own name is the author. He who addresses the writing to the public in the name of the author is the publisher. Kant certainly knows how to save some of the best things for last. He said, someone, because he had a surprise in mind. Someone is not one, but two people, both of whom assume speech, the author, but also the editor, who speaks for the author, was in fact this text great conceptual innovation. Or to put it more precisely, Kant invented a symbolical a symbolic triangle to stand in for the book, a triangle composed of three conceptual figures that were entirely new at that time, the author, the editor, and the public. And their relationship was also entirely new because none of the three could exist without the others. And it is here that we see Kant's main conceptual invention. It is significant because it is an, an innovation that assumes a unity that stands in opposition to the proliferation of texts, of authorities, and of viruses. The author, the editor, the public, and the book. We know that until the 18th century, literary works, in particular, were seen as miscellaneous collections that grouped several authors' contributions together into a single object. That was, there was no, no relation between the text, the book, and the author. It was rare to associate one author with a text and a book. If somehow this association did happen, and it happened, it was strictly by accident. A book was made of a multiplicity. A book was a multiplicity that sometimes turned viral. But with Kant, 
with the move into modernity, with the move away from a caste-based society in which the political subject is just one specimen of the larger multiplicity, and into a class-based society in which the political subject is capable of fabricating its own destiny, it was necessary to suppress this proliferation and to impose a unity so that multiplicity could become profitable in the economic sense of the term. For the stakes are so much economic as they are philosophical, as it was necessary to transform the book in capitalism, into capitalism's perfect object. When a publisher, and I go on with the text, when a publisher um, does this with the, the permission or authority of the author, the act is in accordance with right. And he is the rightful publisher. It's in my back. But if this is done without such permission or authority, that is contrary to right, and the publisher is a counterfeiter or unlawful publisher. The wall of the set of copies of the original document is called an edition. It's easier, end of quote, it's easier if we read the sentence backwards. Our target is the set of copies, now attributable, attributable to a sole beneficiary, or more like two beneficiaries, a producer, also known as an author, and the economic ag agent who enhance the production's value. We often say that Kant aimed to establish a system of literary ownership, and it's true, as long as, long as we do, do not confuse literary ownership with author's rights. We have a tendency to be blind by author's rights, which conceal the rights of the yet another agent, the economic agent, the editor, who nonetheless is never just an economic actor. All of this is, in fact, derived from a certain authority and an authorization. Here, I want to specify that the English translator pushes this logic further than the original text does, doubling the original and proposing to nouns such permission or authority, where the German text only uses one Erlaubnis and not the less common author authorization. The translation accentuates and exaggerates the text possibilities and its conceptual center, the confusion between authority and authorization. But to come back to the text, the economic agent is not just the intermediary in the new symbolic construction around the book, but is also an agent of authority because it guarantees authorization. We owe him for the magical transformation that transforms writers into authors and manuscripts into books. He authorizes, he's the author of other authors, the author of authority. Keeping in mind that authority in, in the context of literature is the expression of a single individuality that brings together a multiplicity. The economic agent is thus much and more than we thought. It is a symbolic agent. He is the guardian of capitalism's magical power or of the, fetish, uh, the fetishism of merchandise, if you will. And because the book is going to become capitalism's most fetishized object, the editor is going to become the book's head magician. Do you think I'm exaggerating? Here it can't again. A writing it's here is not, is, uh, and I go further, a discourse addressed in a particular form to the public. Uh, Um, and the author may be said to, to speak publicly by means of his publisher. The publisher, again, speaks by the aid of the printer of his workman, Operarius, yet known, uh, known in his own name. And here, we need to distinguish the difference between means and aid, where aid refers to the me mechanical operation of what has become an entirely immaterial process so yet not in his own name, for otherwise he will be the author, but in the name of the author, and is only entitled to do so in virtue of a mandate given him to that effect by the author. Now, 
the unauthorized printer and the publish and publishers picks by a national authority in his publication in the name indeed of the author, but without mandate of that effect. I go on without the Latin. Consequently, such an author, unauthorized publication is a wrong commit committed upon the, uh, un, the authorized and only lawful publisher. And here it is. We understand it now. This a wrong committed upon is precisely where the danger is located. Dangerous books are above all those that have committed this terrible, this terrible wrong, and I go on in the quotation, as it amounts to pilfering of the profits which the later was entitled and able to draw from the use of his proper right. A wrong committed, committed against profits, against the very nature of capitalism. The book is and simultaneously material and immaterial. It's to say the nature is the same as that of capitalism, which invests objects with magical qualities by feti fetishizing them. But thanks to the idea of authority, the book occupies a position at the very top of the hierarchy of the mar merchandise. The book constitutes a separate universe, one that is entirely distinct from action, one without an exterior, its own island of intensity. Following this text publication, a debate began among German philosophers who detected a flaw in Kant's reasoning. How can you determine the honor of a speech? Could ownership be based on the ideas that the speech develops? No, the philosophers will say, ideas belong to everyone. An authorized speech is characterized only by its format. Its format, which means style, or the expression of an individual genius. Here we come full circle. The magical unity of this object that is already no longer an object is based on the most immaterial act of appropriation possible, that of style of individual expression. Now we have a better understanding of Tikkun and the Tana case. We understand why, why it's really a literary trial about the very nature of books which unfolds in the middle of a period that endless, endlessly declares its own crisis. Because a large part of the trial revolved around a question that seems nonetheless unfounded. Are you the authors of this book? We also have a better understanding of the irony expressed by a letter to the editor that begins like this. Despite its appearance, it does not behave like a book, but like an editorial virus and in doing so cancels out to 100 years of Kenshin hegemony. Then it goes even further, declaring a death sentence. Book is a dead form, and I can go back to the text. Book is a dead form insofar as it, wa it was holding its readers in the same fraudulent completeness, in the same esoteric arrogance as the classic subject in front of his peers, no less than the classic figure of man. The structure built on unity and completeness trembles. The structure which associates subject, man, and the individual. As Tikkun's authors tell us, this structure, which is not classic but modern, will not hold if its, uh, if its ultimate symbol, the book, loses its identity as a dense block enclosed, locked, and utopic. If the book opens instead to propagation, what follows in the letter is no less suggestive. The end of, institution, of an institution always perceives itself like the end of an illusion, rightly characterizing the book as an imaginary institution that is nothing less than the establishing force of the imaginary. And indeed, I go on quoting, and indeed, it is also the content of truth that causes this outdated thing to be determined a delusion, which, which then appears as such. So that beyond their character of ending, the great books have never ceased to be those which succeeded in creating a community. In other words, the book has always had its existence outside of the self, an idea which was only completely accepted fairly recently." End of quote. And here we arrive at the center of what Glenn was so worried about. These weird communities of readers 
who meet in order to translate the coming insurrection or to read it out loud in Starbucks. These communities that might have, why not, read the, pass the passage in the coming insurrection that potentially inspire the sabotage of the train lines, a passage that talks about flows of communication. There are no more key borders, and this is terrible for Glenn and those like him. By the way, he talks about borders in his sermon. You know the ones, the borders that nice New York, New, New York liberal, liberals want to abolish. The modern book was designed to be a border between an inside and an outside, between the body and the mind, within a reality that was a parallelepiped and symbolically triangular. The book formed a world that belonged to it alone, a world that was perfectly symmetrical, where communication, which had become abstract, was a process that took place between an author and the public via the editor as its intermediary. According to Tikkun's writer, who have a tendency to believe that what they desire, they desire is, in fact, um, in, uh, in fact, reality, this, can, this, can, this cannot hold any longer. It is not the book itself that can no longer hold, but a certain configuration of the book, one that must be reprogrammed. You are well, well placed, um, they say that um, here to the, to the editor at the beginning, you are well placed to ascertain that the end of the book does not signify its brutal disappearance from the social circulation, but on the contrary, its absolute proliferation. In this phase, there are indeed still books, but they are only there to shelter the corrosive effect of editorial viruses. I go on quoting, the editorial virus exposes the principle of incompleteness, the fundamental insufficiency that is in the foundation of the published work. With the most explicit mentions, with the most credibly convenient indication, address, contact, etc., it increases itself in the sense of realizing that the community that it lacks, the virtual community made up of its real life readers. It suddenly puts the reader in such a position that its withdrawal may no longer be tenable, a position where the withdrawal of the reader can no, no longer be neutral." End of quote. Modernity neutralized the book. Tikkun wants to detach the book from its, uh, from, uh, its neutralization to rediscover the savagery, savagery characteristic of end of the 18th century. And they succeed in doing this. Even before they launch their ships full of explosives, their lead bricks aimed at literature, literature soft parts, I mean their three books, The Coming Insurrection to Our Friends and Now, all translated into English, in the end, maybe Glenn does have the kind of understanding that strikes in dazzling and temporary intrusions. But as he hadn't read the book yet, when he did his broadcast, he couldn't possibly have known that one of the book's most scandalous possibilities is that the association of the ideal identifier of a literary style, which is to say the ideal as expression of a coherent unit with an imaginary and collective signatory and is from now on community where possible. This is what makes The Coming Insurrection a dangerous book. Yet, the modern book's savagery and its malfunction is exactly what we are faced with now. There are still some spirits, author written, written and tired, who are staring around to announce the book's ne next death. Of course, the book will survive its reconfiguration. It always does and as for 3,000 years. That being said, confronted with the radical change of certain conditions that regulate the circulation of text, we are required to produce a new imaginary. I recently read a statistic that seemed completely made up, but nonetheless highly significant. In the past 20 years, more people, or should we call them subjects, have published than in the entire history humankind. Primo publicar, después escribir, could be our motto. In these conditions, how can we understand authority? How can we produce a new imaginary of the book, surrounded as we are 
by a regime of generalized publication. We can say that Kant was right for having no, known that in a similar situation, a powerful imaginary organized around a book would establish itself, that it would be translated into specific rights, which is to say that it would moderate people's life, lives. We can say that Glenn Beck was right when he accidentally, through the dialogue that he started with, with the Invisible Committee and with Tikkun, indicated one of the mo major stakes of our current moment. The construction site has been broken up. I hope that some of you will want to get started. Thank you. <laughs>